Okay, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I think we can uh, get started. A few more people may drop in, but but that should be all right. Um, good morning, my name is Yo Seal. Uh, it's a real pleasure to present with my colleague, Joe Ran to you today and to summarize the results from a recent global survey and that sought experts' perspectives about future advancement and cost reduction potential for onshore and offshore wind. Um, before we dig in, though, I do want to start by thanking our collaborators. Um, pulling off this survey was a big effort. This project was led by Ryan Weiser, who unfortunately could not join us today, but without whom this work would not have been possible. It also involved a number of key staff outside of our Berkeley lab at NRO, the University of Massachusetts, and the US Department of Energy and also a stable of advisors from the IEA wind task on cost of wind energy and many people beyond. And of course, uh, this entire effort would have been wasted were it not um, for the large number of wind energy experts uh, that hail from many different corners of the globe that participated. So to my collaborators and everybody who contributed to the survey, uh, thank you very much for your time. Joe, could you advance to the next slide, please? Uh, I want to start our presentation by giving you a general overview of this research effort and then describe our methods and tell you a little bit more about the experts who participated in our panel. Joe will then take over and describe our core survey findings. He will begin by glancing back at a similar survey that we did in 2015. And Joe will then turn to our most recent findings. Uh, he will present on the reductions in levelized cost of energy that our wind experts uh, project over the next 30 years and assess changes in the underlying constituent cost drivers, um, followed by a characterization of how those uh, future wind turbines and their project sites may look like. Uh, Joe will afterwards discuss how a survey respondents judged the promises of different technology options and what constraints will become especially relevant over the next 15 years for project developers. We will then look not just at what options exist in reducing the production costs of wind energy, but also what strategies are thought to be promising for increasing the overall system value of wind energy. I will then wrap up our presentation with some high level takeaways, and we will then look forward to a discussion with you. You will all remain muted uh, throughout today's uh, presentation, but I encourage you to submit written questions here via Zoom. Uh, please use the dedicated Q&A functionality and not general chat. That'll make it easier for us to track your questions. You'll also be able to comment and upvote on other people's questions if you feel inclined to do so. Uh, we will not be able to cover all of our findings within our 16 minute uh, presentation today, but you can go to uh, our project website that is noted here at the bottom of our slide set um, and download this briefing with uh, 30 appendix slides there. You can also download the individual raw anonymized survey responses, a nature energy article um, that covers our core findings and several fact sheets. Uh, you'll also be able to find a recording of today's webinar there in case you want to share it uh, with your colleagues or rewatch it later. Uh, Joe, next slide, please. So um, our project motivation is for the motivation uh, for this work that I'll be describing. It's, it's rather straightforward. Um, as many of you are probably well aware, the contributions that wind will play in the future energy mix will depend, at least in part, on the ability of the sector to continue to innovate, uh, to drive down costs and increase wind value. But especially as the industry has matured over the past 40 years, there's perhaps mounting uncertainty about how much additional advancements might still be possible. 
And yet, despite this uncertainty, one thing we know for sure is that the accelerated cost reductions that we've just witnessed for offshore and onshore wind over the last decade have uh, outpaced any previous forecasts, making older forecasts, including our own that we did in 2015, obsolete. And because of that, um, there is a need for an updated assessment. So you can see that uh, quite nicely here where we have our 2015 projections and then actual empirical cost declines uh, in, in the lines below. Next slide, please. And so it's with this context that we launched in 2020 into a survey-based assessment of uh, future cost reductions, underlying drivers, and anticipated technology trends and trade-offs. Uh, covering onshore wind, fixed bottom, fixed bottom offshore wind, and floating offshore wind. Um, this survey is one of the largest energy technology surveys that has ever been done. Um, this survey is also called expert elicitation in the academic setting. Um, and we were able to uh, get answers for 140 from the world's foremost wind cost experts. The primary purpose of our survey was to inform policy and planning activities, R&D, investment and strategy development by industry, and to refine treatment of wind in energy sector cost models. Uh, having updated wind cost estimates is, for example, quite crucial when developing electric sector decarbonization strategies. To be sure, in constructing the survey, we were attuned to the fact that an expert survey is just one of several methods that can be used to understand cost reduction possibilities, such as, for example, detailed bottom-up engineering assessments uh, or learning curve approaches or reviews of, of recent auctions or tenders. And all of these methods you know, have their advantages and disadvantages. But one of the key benefits of an expert elicitation comes in its ability to directly address uncertainty, seeking not just a single point forecast uh, or an estimate of future costs, but instead a distribution. In our case, that means not only looking at the 50th percentile or median forecast, but also a low and high cost scenario that trace the 10th and 90th percentile of potential advancements in the future. Joe will get uh, into the details of our results, but the primary focus of our survey are changes in the levelized cost of energy or what we will call LCOE from the preceding base year in 2019 to the year 2025, 2035 and 2050. Next slide, please. So uh, let's look a little closer at our sample and our method. Um, at this point, I want to briefly pause and uh, just thank the enormous number of people around the world that helped us make this survey a reality. The survey was run under the auspices of the International Energy Agency WIND program, and many of our colleagues there contributed to the survey design they and many other external advisors also played a key role in helping us identify energy experts in their parts of the world. Of course, this overall research would not have been possible without all those that actually took the survey. And we're very grateful for their generosity, both in terms of knowledge and time. Uh, finally, I want to thank the Wind Energy Technologies Office at the US Department of Energy for funding our study. Next slide, please. I should say just a few words about the experts who uh, responded to our survey. We had reached out to uh, 645 individuals between July and September 2020. Um, that was during the first COVID summer. Uh, and you may remember that things were uh, quite hectic back then. Um, among those 645, we pre-identified a subset uh, to be uniquely qualified, and we may refer uh, later on to some of their responses as the leading experts. 
Um, after multiple encouraging emails, um, we had the good fortune to hear from 140 of them who completed our survey uh, with respondents spanning the full range of uh, organizations that are shown here on the left side, uh, from private developers over manufacturers uh, to universities. Um, and our respondents were being concentrated geographically, primarily in Europe and uh, North America. Next slide, please. Ah, one back. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I've addressed most of the items here in the left box already, but just wanted to clarify that our LCOE numbers exclude any kind of subsidies, uh, as well as grid interconnection costs that are outside of a plan's boundary. So for offshore wind projects, this excludes an offshore substation and collector stations, as well as connections to shore. As we uh, deployed our survey early on in the COVID pandemic, not really knowing what was ahead of us, uh, we also explicitly asked the respondents to disregard any potential COVID effects. Uh, certain macroeconomic uh, drivers, such as interest rates influenced by monetary policies or changes in raw materials, such as steel, uh, are also excluded. We know, of course, that the cost of wind is, is highly variable across projects and time. And uncertain technological and commercial developments will influence future costs. Um, but we think that methods that accept and estimate these variations and uncertainties are um, thus especially advantageous. And with this background, I just briefly wanted to speak to you about expert elicitations as a method over here on the right side in this uh, slide. Our surveying of experts uh, follows established protocols uh, to develop estimates of uncertain quantities based on careful assessments of the knowledge and beliefs of subject matter experts. There's quite a rich literature uh, that provides guidance on question design, how to minimize motivational and cognitive biases and stressing the importance of being very clear of what you actually ask about and providing opportunities for respondents to review and update their assessment as they have a little bit more time to think about your questions. Overall, most respondents completed our very detailed survey in uh, 60 to 90 minutes, so it was quite, a, quite an endeavor for them. Uh, relative to other elicitations, we cast a wide net for a large number of possible participants via an online survey and developed a highly customized survey on the Qualtrics software platform. Next slide, please. I'll be pretty brief about how we refined our survey approach since the first elicitation in 2015. Um, but suffice to say that we put significant efforts into expanding and diversifying our sample, though our total respondent number came in a little bit lower, possibly uh, due to COVID. At this time around, we uh, also required a respondent-specific cost baseline for the start year in 2019, instead of providing one ourselves. And we provided several new tools to make it a little easier for the respondents, for example, uh, WAC or weighted average cost um, uh, capital cost calculator. Uh, we also included a number of new question areas that uh, Joe will talk about in a second. So um, I want to remind you that uh, if you have any questions throughout our presentations, please do submit them via the Q&A function here uh, at Zoom, and we'll get to them at the end of our presentation. Um, and with that, it's my pleasure to hand it over uh, to Joe, who will tell us uh, what we actually found. Thanks, Joe. Um, so I'm going to start here by just briefly summarizing some of the major takeaways of the work. Uh, and then I'll go into a series of slides that describe the results in a lot more detail. So first, both onshore and offshore wind have experienced accelerated cost decline over the past five years, which, as Yo mentioned previously, has really rendered those previous forecasts obsolete. The experts surveyed in 2020 now predict future wind energy costs that are roughly half what was predicted just five years earlier. 
And those cost reductions are driven not only by capital expenditures, as I'll describe later, but also by capacity factors, operating expenditures, project life, and cost of finance. If these lower costs are realized, then wind energy would play a much more substantial role in global energy supply than was previously anticipated. However, as we'll point out, there are considerable uncertainties around these cost projections, which are definitely important to consider in policy, planning, investment, and research. And finally, we will point out that as these costs decline, additional focus will turn to the grid system value of wind energy and to the multiple barriers that may hinder the deployment of wind. Now, Yo kind of teased this slide earlier, but I'm gonna take a moment to dig into it in a little bit more detail. We started our analysis by conducting an ex post analysis of the 2015 survey and compared those results to the actual decline in levelized cost over the past five years. So this figure shows the relative change in LCOE over time with realized LCOE values shown as the solid lines and the 2015 median estimates shown as dotted lines representing the high, median, and low cost scenarios. And those are shown in red, blue, and green respectively. As you can clearly see, the actual cost reduction or the solid lines has far outpaced the 2015 experts predictions, even under that low cost or green scenario shown here. We do identify a number of possible reasons for this, which I'm not gonna go into in detail, but. It's important to note that the experts we surveyed in 2015 were really not alone in missing this rapid cost decline. Other forecasts from the same time were similarly inaccurate. Um, and these recent cost declines, I should say, were an anomaly from historical trends. And this is really part of what motivated us to update this survey in 2020. So I'll turn to those new 2020 results now. So despite that accelerated cost decline that we've seen over the last decades, our experts believe that all three wind applications will see significant additional reductions in the levelized cost of energy. This slide plots those expected cost reductions in the median or best guess scenario relative to respondent specific baselines uh, for the LCOE in 2019. Uh, I should note here that the floating offshore wind figures that are shown on the far right of this slide are compared to a 2019 baseline for fixed bottom offshore wind because there are so few currently operational floating wind projects to compare to. Nonetheless, again, what we see are sizable percentage cost reductions across the board with somewhat greater reductions for offshore wind than onshore. Wait for my slides to advance here. Uh -huh. So to be clear, as I mentioned previously, there is definitely uncertainty in these values. And that uncertainty in part is revealed by the fact that experts actually have different estimates of that future LCOE. Now, previously, I was only showing the median respondent. Here, I also show the 25th to 75th percentile range of experts in the shaded area. So although the experts are consistent in their belief that costs will continue to decline, the precise pace of that cost reduction obviously varies. And the fact that future costs are uncertain is further illustrated on this slide, where we revert back to only showing the median respondent uh, without those shaded areas. But here we present the results not only for the median scenario, but also for the low and high cost scenarios uh, shown in green and red respectively. Now, these results not only illustrate that there's real uncertainty about the pace of future cost reduction, they also demonstrate that the opportunity space for cost reductions is enormous, um, specifically looking at the low cost scenario that might reflect very aggressive R&D and technology advancements. Now, the experts predict future LCOEs that are less than half what we see today. Now, Yo previously mentioned that we identified a subset of what we've called the leading experts within our sample. So we did compare those leading experts against the larger group, 
Um, but as you can see here, we found really only modest differences amongst those two cohorts. The leading experts are shown here um, with the solid lines and the larger group is shown as a dashed line. Um, and you can do, you do see some slight differences, for example, lower costs in this median scenario um, uh, from the leading experts, especially in 2035 and beyond. Now, up to this point, I have been presenting the survey results in percentage terms or relative terms, um, relative to that 2019 baseline that we received from the experts. But here we present the results instead in absolute terms um, in 2019 real US dollars per megawatt hour. Now, a few things stand out from the figure I'm showing here. First, you can see a narrowing gap between the costs of onshore and offshore wind, given the expected fast pace of cost reductions offshore. Uh, and second, there's also a narrowing gap between the cost of fixed bottom and floating offshore wind, as the cost of floating offshore wind is anticipated to decline, especially rapidly. And then third, uh, I'll also point out that there is greater uncertainty in the cost of floating offshore wind than in the other applications. And that perhaps comes as no surprise since that technology is currently less proven. Now, we also examined these data by a number of other factors, um, including region, which I'm showing here. And as you can see from this figure, in general, the experts believe that North America will continue to host the lowest cost onshore wind projects, and Europe will host the lowest cost offshore wind projects. Um, and in general, we see that respondents with expertise in Asia predict that those costs will be somewhat higher in that region. Although I should note that, again, our sample size for um, Asian respondents was rather small at, at a total of six. Now, on this slide, we are contrasting our 2020 survey results shown as the solid lines with the kind of bolder shaded regions uh, um, as 25th to 75th percentile range. We're contrasting those new results with the survey that we conducted in 2015, which again are shown as the dashed lines with the slightly lighter shaded areas. You can clearly see stark differences between these two survey results. Um, there's virtually no overlap between the two sets of future levelized cost estimates with the recent survey results or the 2020 results showing future LCOEs that are roughly half what was expected in 2015. So this comparison leads to a conclusion that's probably obvious to many of you, um, but we should really be aware of dated forecasts. Even um, with, the, with the advancement of these technologies, even a forecast from five years ago um, becomes rapidly outdated. Um, this is maybe obvious to many of you, but it's not always the case in utility planning or policy making, or even in global climate assessment models, where some of these assumptions do stick around for a long time and don't always reflect the most updated assessments. Now, you might be wondering at this point whether our expert predictions for future LCOE are aligned with other forecasts from other leading organizations. Now, this is a pretty uh, detailed and maybe messy figure, and I don't have the time to cover these comparisons at length or in great depth, but I will note just generally that our expert predictions are quite consistent with other cost forecasts from other organizations, particularly for onshore wind, which is shown here on the left. Um, our results do seem to forecast lower offshore costs, especially in the near term than many other analysts, but those forecasts generally converge over time and are quite consistent in 2030 and beyond with one notable exception that you can see uh, on the right hand uh, uh, side of this figure, which is the US EIA, our Energy Information Administration, which happens to be uh, a high cost outlier in this comparison. Now, you might also wonder how those LCOE reductions would actually be achieved. Um, and our survey was not really designed to delve especially deeply into that question, but we did specifically ask about the five individual factors that combine to make up LCOE, and those five factors being capital expenditures, 
operating expenditures, capacity factor, project design life, and the cost of finance. So this figure shows the relative impact of each of those five drivers on LCOE reduction under the median cost scenario. And we find that achieving these cost reductions and levelized costs will require a full systems perspective, considering not only CapEx, but also the four other factors. For both onshore and fixed bottom offshore, the median expert predicts reductions in, in CapEx OPEX and the cost of finance between 2019 and 2035, while also seeing improvements in capacity factor and project life. So as a result, while CapEx reduction is viewed as the largest contributor to reduced LCOE, each of the other four factors also plays an important role. In fact, we found that forecasts that consider only improvements to capital cost will perhaps at best capture about 45% of the total cost reduction opportunity. Now on the right side of this figure, we're showing floating offshore. And I'll admit these comparisons are a bit confusing as we're comparing the 2035 uh, floating offshore estimates with 2019 fixed bottom baselines. But the results nonetheless confirm that a full system perspective is required rather than focusing only on CapEx. Now, we did conduct this same analysis for the low cost scenario, which I'm showing here, but I'll kind of skip over this for the sake of time. Um, turning away from looking ex exclusively at the levelized cost of energy and toward factors including site and project conditions. Uh, it's notable that these cost declines we've shown in the previous slides are predicted despite an expected tendency toward wind sites that are less attractive in some respects. The respondents, for example, predicted that the typical onshore wind project built in 2035 will be located in areas with lower average wind speeds compared with projects built in 2019. For fixed bottom offshore, they expect that a typical project built in 2035 would be 70 kilometers from shore and in 40 meters of water depth. Both of those are higher than current projects. Now turning to floating offshore wind, there's uh, perhaps nothing of great surprise there. Compared to fixed bottom, floating projects are expected to be farther from shore in much deeper water, um, somewhat smaller in size and located in areas with higher average wind speeds. Now, underlying many of these expected trends is an anticipated sustained growth in wind turbine size. By 2035, the median expert predicts that the typical onshore wind turbine will feature a five and a half megawatt generator uh, with a 174 meter rotor mounted atop a 130 meter hub height tower. Uh, the typical offshore turbine will be rated at 17 megawatts with a 250 meter rotor and a 150 meter hub height. Uh, I'll also note here that the leading expert cohort did predict even larger turbines and uh, turbines using lower specific power ratings than the rest of the sample. Now, some of you who follow wind energy market trends might be aware that onshore turbines with ratings of four to five megawatts and offshore turbines with ratings of 14 megawatts are already in fact available on the market. So you might be thinking that the turbine growth that I just showed uh, on the previous slide is maybe not all that impressive. So we also asked about factors that might constrain that continued growth to turbine size. And that's shown in this slide. For onshore wind, issues relating to permitting, transportation, and community acceptance were identified as predominant limiting factors to turbine scaling. And for offshore wind, issues related to logistics were especially highlighted, such as vessels, cranes, ports, and things like that. In both cases, um, design and materials constraints were viewed as somewhat less decisive, uh, as were a number of other factors shown here. We did also look at that question and divide it up by region. We found a few things that are worth noting. For onshore wind, community concerns seem to be less of a constraint in Asia and more so in Europe. And for offshore wind, transportation, vessels, 
Cranes and ports are all considered more challenging in North America than in Europe. Now, we also asked, about, asked the experts about the most important factors in selecting specific turbines for onshore sites in 2035. As you can see here in general, maximizing revenue, streamlining permitting, and minimizing the levelized cost of energy were deemed to be the most important factors for selecting turbines. But we also found, in fact, that most of these factors, perhaps with the exception of policy, which is at the bottom, uh, were considered reasonably important in selecting specific turbines for onshore wind projects in 2035. Now, to this point, I've mentioned a couple of times that the cost of floating offshore wind is forecasted to decline at a faster pace than fixed bottom offshore wind. And that finding is actually validated in some other responses to the survey. Um, specifically, as we show here, the median expert anticipates that up to 25% of all new offshore wind projects built globally in 2035 would feature floating foundations. And consistent with that growing market share for floating offshore, they also believe that the average water depth at which floating becomes less costly than fixed bottom will decline from about 80 meters today to 60 meters in 2035. I'll wrap up with a couple of slides looking beyond the levelized cost of energy. Um, as these costs decline, it's pretty well recognized that wind energy plant design and operations will increasingly be influenced by factors to uh, boost the grid system value of that wind energy. So we did include um, a question in our survey to ask experts uh, specifically about a variety of value enhancement options that might be employed in projects built in 2035. For onshore wind, as you can see, most experts agree that the use of larger rotors will be widespread, but pretty much all of these value enhancement options that we listed are expected to see at least some use. Now for offshore, uh, again, a large number of the options were considered likely to be deployed, including most prominently, again, larger rotors, uh, but also the provisioning of balancing services, interconnection to constrained load pockets, and hybridization with storage, and even hybrid or hydrogen production. Again, we looked at this question regionally. Um, and we found that large rotors and storage hybrids are expected to be utilized in pretty much all regions for onshore projects. Um, and for offshore, the experts anticipate that many of these options will see greater use in Europe than elsewhere around the globe. So now that we've looked in detail at these results, I'll pass it back to Yo to help us zoom out and think about the broader conclusions and implications of this work. Uh, thanks, Joe, um, for this discussion of our core results. Um, before we get into the Q&A session, I do want to add just a um, um, few concluding remarks and uh, want to start by just reviewing again our key findings. So first, wind energy has experienced accelerated cost reductions over the last five years, making previous cost forecasts obsolete. Experts in 2020 anticipate future onshore and offshore wind costs that are approximately 50% lower than what was predicted just in 2015, five years ago. Uh, these reductions will be shaped not only by capital cost reductions, but also by increases in capacity factor, uh, reductions in operational costs, increases in project design lifetimes, and lower cost of finance. If all of this is realized, um, this will allow wind to play a much more substantial role in the global energy uh, supply and in energy sector decarbonization than what many anticipated just a few years ago. So I think that's, that's just really exciting. Um, but uncertainties in the magnitude of these cost reductions are significant and illustrate the importance of uncertainty in modeling and in policy planning, um, investments, and research decisions. And finally, 
As costs decline, additional focus may turn to the value of wind in energy markets and to the many barriers that may be out there to hinder additional deployment. Um, I want to just conclude with a few broad uh, takeaways, for to be precise. Um, first, when performing an expert elicitation, it's really imperative to reach out to a diverse um, but competent set of respondents. Uh, then second, in uh, our ex post analysis, we found uh, evidence of overconfidence and a tendency of experts to understate uncertainty, just kind of looking back at the 2015 results. And I think this uh, applies not just to energy technology costs, but I believe that in general, humans may have difficulty to imagine a very broad distribution of possible futures, including, for example, a very broad range of climate change pathways that are ahead of us. Uh, number three, uh, a common concern is that uh, technology experts may have an advocacy bias. Uh, but at least over the past five years, uh, it seemed that the wind community was not optimistic enough. And finally, um, we will only know in hindsight whether our experts this time around have come closer to the truth. And this will require longer duration validation efforts uh, to assess the persistence of various forms of, um, of biases. Next slide, please. So with this, uh, I want to thank you all for attending today's presentation. Uh, we actually raced through this material <laughs> somehow and, and do have quite a few minutes uh, left in, in case you do have uh, some, some more questions. Um, please feel free to contact either one of us or any of our other team members. Uh, their contact information is shown here on the left side of the, the slide if you have any additional thoughts or questions that we may not be able to answer right now. Um, again, I want to reiterate that you can download a more extensive slide set um, that details, for example, some of the demographic variations to most of our uh, questions uh, at the URL that is uh, listed here. We'll also post that in, in the chat box in just a second, so you have an easier way of clicking at it. Um, you can also find at that URL uh, our journal article and several fact sheets and shorter blogs, um, as well as the underlying data set with all the anonymized uh, raw survey results uh, if you want to dig into that data yourself and, and play with that. Um, finally, our colleagues at the Electricity Markets and Policy Department at Berkeley Lab, um, they're doing a lot of I think really prolific research, and um, we try to make that um, easily accessible on our homepage with briefings and technical reports and interactive uh, visualizations. Um, to be informed about that type of work, um, please sign up to uh, our email list or uh, follow us on Twitter. So I'm going to go ahead and, and paste again the URL to our project website where you can find the aforementioned information. But I would say that we should just uh, head towards uh, Q&A and see whether there are some questions. We've answered a couple of them during the course of today's presentation already. Um, yeah, the, um, and I'll echo Yo's thanks to everyone for attending. Um, and please do, you know, if you have any questions or, or comments you, um, that you'd like for us to discuss, uh, send them in the Q and A. Um, we do have a couple open questions, uh, so maybe I'll I'll start by reading the first one out loud, and yo, know, you and I can kind of ponder it and and then proceed on to the next one. So there's an open question: um, Were you able to ask a subset of manufacturers and or people engaged in R and D about the size trend? Uh, perhaps that would be more informative. So again, as I showed uh, in a number of slides, we, we cut, sliced and diced the data and looked at regional trends. Uh, and, and we certainly also did that by other demographic factors, uh, such as the, the expertise type uh, uh, or, or profession of, of our experts. Um, so maybe I'll see if I can flip back to that slide uh, to, to, to show the size trend. Uh, and then in the meantime, 
Yo, I don't know if you have anything to, to ponder or add to that or, or move on to the next question. Yeah, so so actually we have, um, there was a lot of material in this in the survey data that we got and we weren't able to just fit it all really into one journal article. Um, so one we, you know, have published already with Nature Energy and kind of takes some, gives some of these high level um, uh, ideas, but then we're currently actually writing a second article about uh, what we call like the wind plant of the future and what um, the diving a little deeper into those uh, technology uh, characteristics and set characteristics and what you know may drive those um, and in in the context of that work we um, are looking a little deeper into how views differ by expert demographics and i think like in that in that context we found that our Lead experts were overall a little bit more optimistic and and finding um, larger turbines. So um, yeah, that larger turbines and also uh, lower specific power. Um, so that means just bigger rotor diameter relative to the rated capacity of the nacelle. Um, and for onshore, uh, our uh, manufacturer respondents. Um, are also in that boat of predicting lower specific um, power down to uh, 210 watts per square meter and higher hub heights uh, up to uh, 145 meters. And they were a little bit more aggressive there than um, developers. Uh, for offshore, um, both manufacturers and developers uh, predict larger turbines than other respondent types uh, up to 162 meter hub height um and 275 meters of uh, rotor diameter um and our leading experts also predict uh, larger offshore project sizes than the general sample um so for for fixed bottom offshore for example there was an average project size of 1.1 gigawatt instead of 800 megawatt and for floating offshore they were also a little bit more aggressive um, predicting 800 megawatts instead of 600 megawatts of um, average project sizes yeah so you know maybe that's a good segue to to answer the, this next question uh which i think is a great one is bigger always better for wind turbines um so you know again showing this slide that shows pretty massive scaling from the typical turbine today to that of 2035 um you know why 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 should we always go bigger and and i guess i'd, I'd start by responding that well it, from the 2015 survey five years ago uh and yo you could speak to this as well uh we did ask of what ask the experts what were the the key drivers for the anticipated reductions in lcoe and turbine scaling indeed was was assigned as as the leading driver uh, amongst those experts of, of this expected cost decline. We didn't repeat that question this time around, um, but because of that result from 2015, we wanted to focus especially on, on turbine scaling um, since it was shown to be a leading driver previously. And this really comes down to uh, economies of scale. And so this has been shown historically through the wind in industry uh, over the past 30, 40 years as the industry has matured and developed, uh, as turbines have gotten larger, uh, that's uh, driven a lot of cost decline over that same period. Now, are, are bigger turbines always better uh, in every circumstance? Certainly not. And uh, we have many colleagues uh, at LBL and also at NREL who study, for example, distributed wind energy. Uh, that's primarily focused on smaller scale turbines and or smaller wind plants or installations. And I think in many scenarios and communities, um, those types of uh, turbines and projects are, are certainly much more appropriate for their needs and, and for uh, uh, their use cases. Um, so I think, you know, the, the, into the future, there will continue to be a strong role for distributed uh, and smaller scale wind technologies. Um, but when thinking about these large and utility scale projects, and in thinking about a continued evolution toward lower uh, levelized costs uh, of those projects, uh, turbine scaling uh, and this growth that, that is, has been anticipated is going to continue to be a, a key to unlock that. Anything to add to that, Yo? No, I think I think you captured it really well. I, I, and I do agree that there will continue to be, you know, a, a broad 
uh, distribution of um, turbine types, uh, you know, out there. I think on average it will trend to these bigger projects, but um, maybe some more community-based windows so will um, like to have smaller smaller turbines there. Um, one question about whether or not LBNL has done a parallel study of solar PV costs. Um, we <laughs> have spent many hours trying to pitch this to the Department of Energy and um, convince them that uh, we would like to get some funding to do similar forward-looking uh, solar PV and battery cost uh, assessments. But unfortunately, so far, I have been unsuccessful with that. Um, we have, uh, you know, done a lot of historical uh, cost analysis, both for wind uh, and uh, for solar following current market uh, trends. We do um, have three annual or maybe even four annual um, technology tracking reports that we put on our website for free. Uh, one is the, the wind market uh, technology report, and then when we have one for distributed solar, and one for large-scale utility solar, and then one looking at a wholesale uh, market valuation in the United States of uh, solar generation. Uh, but most of those assessments are backwards looking with the exceptions of uh, looking a little bit at interconnection um, capacities and, and some trends there. So unfortunately, uh, currently we're, we're not um, planning a, a similar effort for, um, for solar. Yeah. Um, so let's move on to the next question. Um, why are the predicted turbine sizes so unambitious compared to what's available commercially today? Um, yeah, I, I, I did speculate a little bit about that on the uh, constraints to turbine growth slide that uh, maybe I'll bring that slide up again momentarily. Um, but I guess maybe one thing I'll, I'll point out in response to that question is that, you know, while onshore turbines uh, with ratings around five megawatts and offshore turbines uh, with, with a ratings of 14 megawatts are commercially available today, those certainly are not what you might consider the typical turbine installed in the typical wind project. Um, and so that's really what we are asking these experts about, not about kind of the tails of the distribution or the extremes. We wanted to know really, if you thought about the, the median or the most typical wind energy plant installed in 2035, what technologies would be utilized then? So, you know, again, th maybe that's not still not all that remarkable, but um, transitioning from a typical of about two and a half megawatts onshore today to five and a half megawatts in 2035 um, does show substantial growth in, in that typical case. And, and we expect a kind of commensurate growth in that kind of extreme case turbine size to be much larger as well. Um, so I guess that would be my, my initial response to that. And, and maybe I'll, I'll flip back to that constraint slide, but yo, do you have anything else to add to that one? I think another thing maybe worth mentioning is that we asked people in 2020 about that, and at that time, you know, Vestas has not yet uh, had not yet announced its its very large uh, future offshore um, platform, and so what was available back then uh, seemed maybe a little bit. So in the context of that information, it seemed a little bit less, um, maybe a little bit more ambitious. What what people said. Um, I don't know, maybe it just gets back to the general uh, question of like, how good are we really at imagining really bold, you know, future ideas? I guess on the one hand, it's easy to imagine bold futures, but uh, how realistic do we think is it to have uh, technological progress there? And we know in the past, we've not been ambitious enough, um, not just for wind, but also when one looks at uh, cost declines for, for solar, uh, the learning curves there have often kind of like outpaced what um, people originally assumed to be possible. So, um, yeah, I think it remains to be seen whether or not they are unduly unambitious or whether, you know, they're getting, getting quite close. Yeah, and um, yeah, exactly. I, I, I think, you know, maybe just to, to pile onto that point um, and reiterate it a little bit, um, yeah, certainly the, the turbine growth forecasts from the 2015 survey uh, uh, 
have been shown to be underestimates as well. So um, yeah, that may or may not be the case uh, this time around. So let's move on. I am seeing at least one question in the chat as well. So we'll try to get to that uh, also, but um, let's stick with the questions in the Q&A. And, and just a reminder to folks, uh, just do please submit those questions into the Q&A if you can. Um, so this question says, were experts able to break out trends or needs in the various components of LCOE? Particularly, is offshore maintenance a serious block to lower LCOEs in the long term? Um, let me flip back to that slide again, um, which kind of gets at that question, I think. Um, but if we don't answer it appropriately, uh, feel free to, to reach out to us via email, um, and, and we can try to answer your question more comprehensively. Um, but I would say that, you know, of course, we did break out these specific, these five specific factors that that are used to derive levelized cost of energy. Um, and as you, as you can see for fixed bottom offshore, uh, the, the, median, the median respondent expected that operational expenditures and that, that I think maintenance falls into to OPEX. Um, for fixed bottom offshore, the, the median estimate was that OPEX would decline by 22% um, and which would result in uh, a, let's see, a 5% uh, reduction in, um, yeah, a 5% reduction in LCOE. So I guess to answer the question more specifically, um, yes, the experts were asked to break out those components and um, OPEX is expected to, to decline substantially for, uh, between now and 2035, um, but we, we didn't ask them about these trends beyond 2035. Yeah, and in our results here, we I don't think that we really have one graph that compares just the constituent components of LCOE in, in kind of an absolute terms uh, mm -hmm. for 2019 and, and 2035 uh, to you know see what the relative share of uh, capex versus opex uh, is, for example. Um, I, I don't think that we have such a slide prepared. It would certainly be you know, possible to to get at the data from from the underlying data that we um, that we have, but maybe this is a good point just to reiterate a little bit or say something more about our um, survey tool. Um, people had you know an LCOE calculator on the side where they could put in lots of their input assumptions and then um, play with that. That uh, helped them to then you know derive LCOE estimates for twenty twenty five and. 2050 and for 2035 we actually asked them specifically uh, for those LCOE components for those three different scenarios. Yeah, I think um, for the next question I want to skip actually down uh, in our in our Q&A list because there's a, a question or kind of response that that carries on our previous conversation relating to, to turbine size and scaling. Um, so this one says our, our last solicitation focused on newer, larger turbines, and we used 15 megawatts as the baseline because industry believe this will be the case by 2030, and we do not see 15 megawatts as extreme. Um, so yeah, that's a really interesting perspective, clearly from someone who uh, is seeking to procure <laughs> uh, energy from from offshore wind, and. Um, I think I just the reason I wanted to highlight this is just to note that you know when we ask these questions. Uh, um, for 2019 as a baseline and 2035 as, as kind of the future estimate. Um, just to be clear, we, we were not asking about turbines that were being procured or, or projects that were being solicited or even signed uh, in those dates or those years. We were asking specifically about projects being installed in those years. So uh, indeed, although it, you, know, you may be soliciting projects for 2030 using 15 megawatt turbines, um, projects that are installed today uh, or in 2021 uh, are likely using, you know, the typical project is using much smaller turbines for offshore wind. Um, but, but great to have that perspective. Thanks for chiming in. Um, let's see. Uh, Joel had asked one question about the, the general um, weighing of uh, wind turbine uh, generation equipment versus um, balance of, of plant um, on the on the capex side, and unfortunately, we did not uh, ask uh, 
people specifically about that. We only had one overall CapEx uh, bucket in our LCOE calculator. And so unfortunately we cannot uh, talk about that and or at least the perspectives of our respondents. Yeah. Um, let's see. Steve had asked um, a while ago, I think this was related to the perspectives of um, manufacturers and developers about uh, future, um, well, uh, turbine characteristics and, and LCOE developments um, and uh, whether or not those respondents did any better in the 2015 survey. What I do remember back from the 2015 survey is that those who we you know, somewhat subjectively classified as leading experts uh, who we had just uh, especially high respect for and, and the knowledge of the industry, those people did tend to do um, better back in, in 2015. Um, I think for, Joe, you've presented on that today a little bit already, right? This time around, leading experts, um, our our group definition has eased a little bit, and we now have more people in this group than in 2015. Um, I think they do tend to still be uh, a little bit more aggressive in their predictions, um, but not by the same degree as they were back in 2015. Um, correct. Yeah. So, yeah, I guess. Okay, so the question was whether leading experts did better in the 2015 survey. Uh, we, we, yeah, as part of that kind of ex post analysis, we did again slice and dice the data by these kind of demographic factors, including, um, you know, their, whether they were a leading or a larger group expert and what, you know, what type of organization they, they hailed from uh, and whether they were uh, what we kind of classified as a, uh, a systems level expert or a subsystems, meaning they focused on particular components of the wind turbine or wind plant, or um, or uh, whether they were more of an expert in kind of markets and cost and policy and that sort of thing. Um, when we did this ex post analysis, uh, unfortunately, we didn't find any of these factors to be particularly telling in terms of, you know, for example, like you said, the, were the were the leading experts actually any better at at predicting uh, those future cost declines? Uh, maybe a little bit uh, if you just looked kind of at trend lines. Uh, but when we uh, did statistical tests on those trends, uh, we didn't find that uh, kind of a, from a statistical level, uh, we weren't able to find any difference of of statistical significance uh, in, in those results. So I guess the short answer is is no. <laughs> Um, yeah, and we've, we're just about out of time. Uh, I'm happy to stick around a little bit longer. Um, uh, and uh, maybe I'll, I'll just switch back to that final concluding slide. So we'll, we'll put our, our emails up again and our contact information. I do want to reiterate, feel free to reach out to us at any time. Uh, and I definitely recommend, as Yo mentioned, uh, signing up for our newsletter. Um, but, but Yo, I can stick around a little bit longer uh, to answer some more questions. Uh, I don't know whether you're available as well. Yeah, yeah, me too. And I think we only have two or three um, left. But in case people need to drop off, you know, thank you very much for, for attending today. It's been a great, clearly very thoughtful questions here as well. Uh, so, so thanks a lot um, for that. Um, Larry had asked whether or not um, uh, the existing technology is too heavy to economically exploit uh, floating offshore. Joe, I'm not sure whether you want to comment on that. I think like in our research, again, we found that floating offshore uh, has higher expected cost reductions relative to fixed bottom offshore, mm -hmm. um, but that there is still a certain cost premium uh, associated uh, with that. And so if at any given site, you can either um, install uh, floating or fixed bottom uh, offshore, you know, fixed bottom probably will win out, although the further you progress from shore or the deeper uh, the water depth is, there's some kind of crossover point where that floating offshore will become more attractive than we've seen clearly in our results that that is going to decrease from, I think, 80 meter depth to 60 meter or so, right, um, by, by 2030. But I guess maybe zooming out for, for a moment, there will be areas, for example, out here at our California coast 
where a pixel bottom uh, offshore is probably not really an option, just given the water depths that we have. Um, and so if we see um, a lot of value still in those generation profiles of offshore wind out there, um, then in, in that context, uh, floating offshore might really only be the, the only economic uh, solution relative to fixed bottom offshore. Yeah, yo, I mean, I, I think you, you covered that question well. Um, I, I guess I would just add that, you know, we, yo and I could sit here and speculate about whether we think uh, the floating, you know, existing floating uh, offshore turbine technology is, is too heavy to work commercially. But, but really, the point of this survey was not to ask yo or my opinion, uh, although <laughs> we might be glad to weigh in on that. But um, in, indeed, we asked 140 of the world's foremost experts, uh, and, and certainly not all of those 140 answered questions about floating offshore. Uh, again, as Yo showed in an early slide, only a subset actually answered questions relating to floating offshore. Nonetheless, uh, what we found from our results is that you know they do definitely see um, commercial application of floating offshore wind, uh, and and quite viably so, perhaps not today, but um, by 2035, making up up to a quarter of all offshore wind installations. So, uh, you know, whether or not uh, today's technology is is too heavy, I guess I can't really speculate on, but um, certainly there, that technology is advancing rapidly and is expected to be fully commercial, you know, commercially viable uh, within the, the near term. Yeah. Nasrallah had asked, um, whether we could speak a little bit more about uh, offshore or onshore wind relative to solar um, in developing nations. And I think this is just like a, just in general, a good uh, place to reiterate that, uh, of course, our results vary by region, right? And it depends on what kind of local wind resources you have, because that then drives your capacity factors and thus influences the levelized cost of energy. And then uh, in places where you don't have a whole lot of existing uh, industry um, for deployment, you know, costs can be maybe higher than if you have a very well-established um, infrastructure. Um, I, in this context of, of this uh, study, we haven't done um, comprehensive assessment of uh, how wind expected future wind costs compared to uh, future solar costs and what would be most appropriate for specific uh, regions or, or nations. Unfortunately, we will not be able um, to, um, to talk about that. And uh, unfortunately, our data is not that great uh, when it comes to developing nations and expected future wind energy costs there either. And in contrast to 2015, we really tried to do reach out more to international experts outside of uh, North America and Europe. Um, but we were unfortunately not as successful in, in ultimately really getting a lot of data. We have uh, some respondents from um, uh, Latin America. I don't have their numbers on the top of my head now, uh, but you can find uh, their uh, results in, uh, in the underlying data set. Yeah, not, so. not sure, Joe, if you have anything to add. Um, other than that, Victor had asked like this big chicken and egg question. <laughs> yeah. uh, future deployment will drive down prices. Why would anybody want to buy uh, renewable energy now if in the future it will become less uh, expensive and whether only a strong policy driver would motivate anybody to buy uh, renewables already today? I, I think the um, you know, this is somewhat of a philosophical um, question. Um, and we know that some people like PG&E in 2010 got burned maybe by high, not burned, but they signed high PPAs for solar uh, back in 2010 and ultimately restructured some of those contracts in the context of the bankruptcy proceedings a few years ago. Um, I, I think we've seen in Texas, uh, recently with the shortage of uh, capacity in, in that market, that if you just rely on short-term wholesale electricity prices um, to contract your energy, that you're quite exposed to price spikes and that these long-term um, 
PBAs uh, can offer quite a bit of hedge value. Uh, and so, you know, that that's pretty great. Also, if you just uh, compare the cost of wind and solar today relative to uh, other generation sources, um, at least in the um, continental US, wind and solar often outcompete um, natural gas or um, coal power. And so, you know, from that perspective, you already have a better deal there. Um, I think maybe the perspective changes a little bit for corporate procurers who just want to buy recs and you know have a certain amount of recs that they need to have by a certain amount uh, by a certain year. Um, but then again, many of these uh, companies have interim goals, and uh, yeah, only you know we, we can only really drive this industry forward if people are willing to um, um, deploy now uh, in at, at this day and and, and year. Um, I, I think if we look at the market, um, there is, seems to be, at least here in the United States, uh, enormous growth of, um, of wind and solar that is happening right now. So it doesn't seem that many market uh, actors are, are just holding back and, and, and waiting, but um, many do commit already. Yep, great, great answer, Yo. Nothing to add from me. <laughs> uh, we did get one more, uh, it looks like a latecomer, uh, but. Uh, so the question is, do you break down the decline in weighted average cost of capital between risk-free rate and risk premium? Um, unfortunately, we did not. Uh, we did not exactly specify that uh, in the survey. So, so no uh, is the short answer there. Yeah, I think like the only uh, uh, you know point to that. I'm not quite sure what you mean by risk-free rate. Um, we asked the respondents to disregard any potential. Uh, larger um, monetary policies that in general uh, influence overall interest rates um, uh, and uh, we're you know specifically interested in WAC specific to uh, to win projects um, but I'm you know unfortunately we, we won't be able to really compare much more or give much more detailed answers on that yep. yeah and I think with that we can we can wrap up uh, thank you very much. Um, data and more information is posted on our website. Um, thanks a lot for joining us today. And we hope you have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.